Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we do analysis for functions with several variables. And in today's part 31, we will talk about the so-called Lagrangian function. This one can be used to reformulate the method of Lagrange multipliers. And as you already know from the former parts of this video series, this method is used to find extrema under constraints. And before we dive into this important method again, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, by using the link in the description, you find a lot of additional material for the videos. And now I would say, a good starting point for this video is to discuss again how the method of Lagrange multipliers work. First of all, there are C1 functions given, and the one we want to consider for extrema is called f. And the other ones are used to describe the constraints, and we call them gj. And we say that we have m of them, where m is usually less or equal than n. So equivalently, one can also put all these functions into a vector valued function g. And now in the next step of the method, we search for points x in the domain of f, so x in Rn, that satisfy some equations. More precisely, we have n plus m equations they should satisfy. First, we have m equations for the constraint, so we want that g of x is equal to 0. And there we actually have the 0 vector in Rm on the right hand side, so we have m equations here. And on the other hand, as you already know, we have this gradient equation where we also find the Lagrange multipliers. And since the gradient is a vector in Rn, we have actually n equations here. And in order to satisfy these equations, we have the freedom to choose m Lagrange multipliers. And this is already the whole method, because the solutions x of these equations give us candidates for finding extrema of f under the constraint g of x is equal to 0. And now it turns out that we can put these equations here into a more compact form. And this makes it much easier to remember the whole procedure here. Indeed, the only thing we have to do is to define a new function while using the C1 functions which are given. And this new one is what we call the Lagrangian function of our problem. And usually it's denoted by a capital L or by a capital lambda. And the most important thing to remember here is that it gets two inputs namely a vector in Rn and a vector in Rm. But still it should be a real valued function, so the codomain is given by R. And now what we usually do is to write L of x and lambda. Hence this lambda here is now a vector with m components. And now I would say, the only thing you have to remember now is the definition of this Lagrangian function. So this one is important, it's given by the function f of x minus a combination of lambda with the function g of x. And now the common way to write this is lambda times g of x. And here the dot denotes the standard inner product in Rm. So not so complicated, this thing here just represents a whole sum with m entries. And maybe as a reminder, Let's write this down as well. So we have the coefficient lambda 1 times the function g1. And then we have the same with lambda 2 and g2. And this simply continues until we have lambda m times gm of x. So this is actually what we want to have, but you see it's much easier to write this down with the standard inner product, the vector lambda and the whole function g of x. But no matter which form you prefer, the result is now that we can use this Lagrangian to calculate extrema of f under the constraint. Indeed, we will calculate the gradient of L, so we will see the function L as a function with m plus n inputs. So this simply means that the gradient of L is a vector in Rn plus m. Hence, in the next step, we can just formulate this vector. 
The first component would be dl with respect to x1. And this continues until we have dl with respect to xn. And then we would start with the lambda coefficients. So we have dl with respect to lambda 1. And obviously also this continues until we have lambda m. And that's it. This is the whole thing we want to have. And now by using our definition of L, we can calculate all these components. And there we see, with respect to the components of X, we have the partial derivatives of F and the partial derivatives of the G functions. In other words, for the first N entries here, we just have gradients. Namely, we have the gradient of F minus the gradients of the G functions. So first we have lambda 1 times the gradient of G1, then minus lambda 2 times the gradient of G2, and so on. Hence, in the end here, we get just the whole sum of the gradients of the G functions. And we also have the coefficients lambda j involved, so this is something we should recognize from before. However, before we discuss that, let's first finish the whole gradient here. So the next question would be, what is the partial derivative of L with respect to lambda 1? This is easy to see, because lambda 1 only occurs in this term here. So it's actually just minus g1 of x. Therefore, we have a similar thing for all the other lambda coefficients, and the last one here would be minus gm of x. In other words, we could also simplify these m components there, just by saying that this is minus g of x. So let's do that in the next step here. We just say that we have the first and the second entry. So with these two essential parts, the gradient is easy to read. And moreover, the whole gradient of L vanishes if these two vectors here vanish. And there we already have it. This is the reformulation of the method of Lagrange multipliers. We see the gradient of the Lagrangian is zero if and only if our two equations are satisfied. And I would say the left hand side here is much easier to remember because it looks exactly like we know it for finding extrema in the normal way. This means if we have constraints, we do the same thing as always, meaning we set the gradient to zero and search for solutions. However, in the case of constraints, we do it for the Lagrangian instead of doing it for the function f. So I would say this is exactly how you should remember this method of Lagrange multipliers. We just have two C1 functions given, f from Rn to R, and g maps Rn into Rm. And then we search for the local extrema of f under the constraint of g is equal to zero. And then you know we get a necessary condition for these if we also assume that the Jacobin of g gives a subjective map. In fact, this then implies that the gradient of the Lagrangian at the point x tilde is equal to zero. And as we have shown before, we just have to find suitable Lagrange multipliers such that this equation is satisfied. And that's it. This is the method of Lagrange multipliers where we use the Lagrangian function. So this is the version you definitely should remember and it's also helpful to have a procedure in mind. So just like a recipe, you can use for calculating extrema under constraints. The first step should always be to write down the correct constraint g. You have seen that in the video before where we discussed an example, sometimes the constraint is not directly given, but just described in some way. Therefore, formulating the function lowercase g and the constraint capital G is the first step. And then in the next step, we can check if this regularity for the Jacobian is satisfied for all points in capital G. This is the best case scenario because we can use the whole method for all the points in G. Otherwise, we might get some exception points we have to discuss separately. Moreover, if we have too many exception points, the whole method will not work at all. Therefore, still the best case is that we have this property for all x in g. Okay, and then the next step would be to form the Lagrangian L. 
So we use the explicit forms of the functions, simplify them as much as we can, and then we have the Lagrangian function L. And then, as we know, we just have to solve the gradient equation for the Lagrangian. And then, in the best case, we get a finite number of candidates x tilde in Rn. So only at these points we can have a local extrema of f subject to the constraint g is equal to zero. And now the last point here is not so clear, because now we have to argue that we actually find a maximum or a minimum at a given point. In other words, now we need a sufficient criterion to actually decide if we have a maximum or a minimum at a given point. And you might already guess that the second order partial derivatives of L might help there. In fact, for C2 functions it's possible to formulate such a sufficient criterion where we have to use the Hessian of the Lagrangian. However, in simple applications this is not needed because you have enough knowledge about the function f to decide if you have a maximum or a minimum at a given point. One possible reasoning of this kind you have seen in part 30 of this series. Therefore, I would say this is good enough. This is the method of Lagrange multipliers with the necessary condition in mind. Moreover, with this I want to close this series of multivariable calculus because we have discussed everything we wanted. Of course, there are still a lot of other topics for functions with several variables we could discuss, but we can do that in another series. So you can tell me in the comments what you want to see, and then we can meet in the next video series again. So thank you very much for listening, and have a nice day. Bye bye.